Here's the question for you. How do you respond to God when you're going through hard times? How do you respond to God when you're going through problems? How do you respond to God when you go through trials, tribulations, temptations, heartbreaks? How do you go through, when you're going through the darkest time in your life, how do you respond to God? Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are, is ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Holy Spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of God, and this is Jesus. Jesus was dressed in robes reaching down to his feet with golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool and, and white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace and his voice was like the sound of a rushing voice. In his right hand, Jesus held the seven stars and coming out of the mouth was sharper double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brightness. When I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then Jesus placed his hand, right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last. I am the living one. I was dead and now, I, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. John, write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mysteries of the seven churches that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. I, I, I don't want to pick on you, so I'll pick on myself. There are many days I'm disgusted with how I read the Bible. I, I, I read a passage like this that is so heavy, and I blow through it. I, I know I have to read the Bible as a Christian, and, and I turn it into religion instead of relationship. And, and I, I want to read so many verses, and therefore I just... And I go, okay, I did it. Check it off. Yet when you read this carefully... There is such meat in it. And let's just read one part of it, okay, where it's verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus Christ on the, on the Isle of Patmos. Why? Because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The Isle of Patmos is around 30 miles long. It's a little island. It's mostly rocks. Very little vegetation. And the emperor of Rome, when he didn't want somebody like a, a criminal who wasn't going to be executed because they weren't murderer, but they were just a pain to the emperor, they would ship them to Patmos. So he is on this island in his darkest hour with criminals. Some of them are murderers. Some of them are thieves. And he knows he's not going to get off. There is no exit plan. There is no lifeboat, there is nothing. I mean, when the boat pulls in and throws you on shore, they don't give you food or anything. You are there, and here's the thing. You live, well, here's the odds. You're probably going to die because there's no food. They, what, what's on the isle or the island is what you have to eat. So you eat fish or shellfish, or, or, or if you see any vegetation, you try to eat it. The darkest hour. And what does he say? He, he says this. He says this. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus was on the Isle of Patmos. Hey, can I ask you something? In your darkest hour, 
Is your darkest hour consuming you so you can't hear or see or worship Jesus? I mean, so many times when we're going through our darkest hour, where is God? And here is John in his darkest hour. He knows this is the place he's going to die. He's probably going to get a disease or he's going to starve to death. Yet God says to him, hey, John, write the book of Revelation. In 2023, they're going to be reading it at Queensway. Now, here's the crazy thing. Most of us, we want to negotiate with God. Well, Lord, I'll do it, but you need to take me off this island, put me in the Ritz Hotel. I need a new iPad. I like some new clothes. And it, I'm going to charge you only $250 a day. If God doesn't do it my way, then I don't want you God. In his darkest hour, God uses him with the most powerful thing he could ever do, write the book of Revelation. To to get paper or scroll or anything on this island was next to impossible. But John knew that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And therefore, when you look at John at, at, in his darkest hour, in his suffering, he has patient endurance for one reason. God, you want me to write this? You'll supply it. God, you want me to write Revelation? You'll supply the food. God, if you want me to do this in, on the Isle of Patmos, fine, I'll do it. But here's the truth. I know that you're going to have to come through. Lord, I'll trust you with all my heart. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. Be truthful with you. This is way out of my box. In all my ways, even on the Isle of Patmos with all the criminals around me, you direct my path. See, here's the craziest thing. When we read stuff like this, we just blow through it. Instead of stopping and thinking, How can this apply to me? The second one is verse 17. When I saw him, Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then Jesus placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the the first and last Alpha Omega. I'm the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Can, can I ask you, uh, it just, don't, don't, don't answer it out loud. In your darkest hour, can you worship God? Or, or does your darkest hour consume you? In your darkest hour, can you worship God, or does your darkest hour consume you? Let me give you an illustration. I, I'm downtown in the hospital with one of these old ladies and she's dying of cancer, and she, she's literally a couple of days away from seeing Jesus. She can't lift her hands. And I'm sitting there, and, uh, you know, she likes, she likes the song, Because He Lives. She can't sing it. She's got oxygen. And, but she's, she's there, and I sing quietly, Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And she goes like this. I think it's because my singing is bad. (laughs) And she takes her mask and she goes, can you lift my hand? I want to worship him. But my right hand, I don't have enough strength. Can you lift my hand for me? Go ahead, sing it again, pastor but let me worship him with my hand up. And I take her hand and I gently raise it, not up too high, but gently raise it. And I sing, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And I raise my hand and she raises hers. 
and she cries like a baby. And she starts singing with me, because he lives, all fear is gone. In her darkest hour, the cancer didn't consume her, but the worship of the Lord did. And John says, I fell. I fell at his feet, though dead. Now, for some of you, you, you worship God really beautifully with singing, but have you ever expanded your worship? There's more to worship than singing. I mean, I, I'm a little bit ticked off when people hear worship, they think music. Worship is much more than music. And I thank God for our worship leaders. Give my right arm for them. When was the last time you did something for God that was biblical, but you weren't comfortable? Recently, when I'm alone and my wife's out of the house, I've been working on shout to the Lord. The Bible says shout to the Lord, right? Now, I don't do it when my wife's in the house because the fact is that she'll, just, she'll, she'll have a nervous breakdown. But she gets out, she gets out uh, of the house, and, and I know she's gone for a while, and, and all of a sudden I just go back and forth in the family room or the living room, and I just shout, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I'm not comfortable doing it. I'm not a shouter. Hey, hey, John, he falls. When, when was the last time you didn't only use your voice or you, you used your hands a little bit, but you used your knees or you even laid prostrate before Father God in worship? Twice a day, I try to kneel. Not, not because I'm religious, but I want to show him that physically I'm going to try to worship you also. Just not with my heart, not with my mind, not with my voice and maybe with my hands, but I'm going to be uncomfortable to show you that I love you and I have reverence for you, Father God. In John's darkest hour, he did not let the darkest hour consume him, but he fell before the Lord. Now, falling here, this is a nice carpet. It needs a little bit of vacuuming, but it's a nice carpet. <laughs> but, but he is falling on rocks, sand, He, he's falling in dirt in order to worship God. How, how many of us, well, you know what? I, I, I want to kneel before the Lord. Well, let me find something comfortable where I can kneel. There's criminals around. The island's probably full of criminals. And he, he, you know, to get a quiet spot by yourself, probably next to impossible. He doesn't care. When you worship God, spiritually, physically, emotionally, the Bible teaches me you usher in the presence of God. Now, here's the sermon. If you're not getting anything, it's here. True worship from your heart that comes through physical, emotional, verbal, ushers in the presence of God. Great healing crusades, where God has moved in great ways, the first part of the service is 40 minutes to an hour of just worshiping the presence of the Lord so his presence can come in to do the supernatural. Why do we do worship before we preach? In order to usher in the presence of God. And, and what happens is John, 
John is on the Isle of Patmos, and God wants to speak to him, and God starts showing him this revelation. And what does John do? John shows his humility by lying before the Lord on sand and rocks, and probably there's criminals walking by going, what is he doing? And John doesn't care, and the presence of God comes, and the Lord says, do not be afraid. I'm your Alpha, and I'm your Omega. I was dead, but now I'm alive forever. And John, you don't have to be worried on the Isle of Patmos. I hold the keys to death and Hades, but I, I also hold the keys to the Isle of Patmos. So trust me. Let me take you to number one, reverence for God. My personal opinion is we have lost it. We treat God like a sugar daddy. The only time we talk to him is when we want something. I mean, when was the last time you had reverence? Be still and know that I am God. You quieted your heart. It, you didn't go into prayer like a bulldozer. Okay, God, I got five minutes. Let's do this quick. Hurry up. When, when was the last time you, you, you showed reverence and respect to God Almighty? You called him Father, and you were in a hurry. Number two, don't be afraid when you worship him. A lot of us, we only worship him in areas we're comfortable. Let me give you an illustration. Probably 20% of this church, you love the Pentecostal story, and they received, when they spoke in tongues in Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 19, they spoke in tongues. You love that Pentecostal experience, but you haven't entered into it because you're not comfortable. I, I, I don't raise my hands during worship when the worship team's leading. I'm not comfortable. Or here's one for you. Th this is not of God. That's not me. God wants you to worship him not according to what you want, but according to what he has in his word. The Lord speaks to me, Billy, you know, the Bible says, shout unto the Lord. Billy, you don't do a lot of shouting. Well, Lord, you know, I've got to speak. I've got to guard my voice. Stop making stupid excuses. Well, Lord, you know, I'm 66 years of age. I don't want to kneel down, and, you know, people will think it's religious. Well, then do it when nobody's around. <laughs> See, do not be afraid, he says. Do not be afraid of Patmos. Do not be afraid of your darkest hour because if you take your eyes and take it off the waves, Peter, I will let you walk on the water. Amen. Do not be afraid. I'm with you. Yesterday, I'm in this town called Gananoque. It's a long drive to get there. The room is full of men for this men's conference. And I got nervous. I get nervous quite a bit. Like, I, 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 when I speak, I get nervous. And I said, Lord, I can't do this without you. And I heard the voice of God said, go for it. I'm with you. And it, it felt so good. And sure enough, he was there because my sermon was just trash. But man, the altar call was phenomenal. L let me take you to number three, I, and I love this, okay? Christ is. In your heart, you have to have Christ as your alpha and your omega, the beginning and the end. You have to have him in your heart as the living one. So he is bigger than the trouble you're going through. He is eternally alive, but that doesn't mean you let him be alive in you unless you open up to let him be alive. He holds the keys to everything. But that doesn't mean he's going to push his way in. He stands at the door and he knocks. If anyone hears his voice, 
and opens the door, he will come in. Now, for some of us, we have let him in for salvation, we've let him in for other things, but we haven't let him in to the fullness of what God wants. And that's what God's been speaking to me about. Billy, I want to have the fullness in you, not just what you've picked. So here's the application. Number one, realize who Christ is. Not in your head only, but in your heart. Because when the Allah Patmos comes, when it's in your head, it's going to disappear. But when it's in your heart, let me give you an illustration. It doesn't matter what situation I go through in life. My love for my wife is deep because it's in my heart. My love for the Toronto Maple Leaf is in my head. And many nights I want to get it out of my head. But my love for my wife is in my heart. And you are not going to rob me of it. Realize who Christ is. When you hit the Isle of Patmos, Christ better be in your heart. Number two, worship Christ from your heart. I don't want to kneel. I do not want to shout. It's not a matter of what I want. It's a matter of what's in his word. I do not live according to what I want. I live according to his will. Live life to the fullest because of Jesus. Let him be the beginning and the end in your life. Let him be the living. Let him be the eternal. And let him hold the keys in your life. Christ Jesus is our future. Let, I told this story, but please let me tell it again and smile like you've never heard it. Famous evangelist Terry Law, he had ministry teams, singing teams, preaching teams all around the world. I mean, he, he just incredible minister. Probably led over 500,000 people minimum to Christ. Minimum. Terry Law when he went preaching overseas and through the United States and Canada, always had healing services and miracle services. I mean, people would get healed. They would bring stretchers to his services. People get healed. I mean, people, uh, uh, unbelievable. In the middle of his ministry, when it was at the peak, his wife comes down with cancer. and Everybody thinks she's going to get healed, and she dies. Now, he's devastated. This is his Isle of Patmos. Lord, I've seen thousands of people healed of cancer. I've seen blind people healed. I've seen deaf people. I've, I've, seen, I've seen everything. I've seen over 500,000 people come to Christ. Lord, and you took my wife. And he went into a state of depression. He went into his house, he turned the phone off, he shut the door, he put a sign on the door, don't bother me. And nobody saw him for days. No, nobody. Nobody saw him leave, nobody saw him come. The, the, the office needed answers in order to run the ministry, and he wouldn't answer the phone. But his best friend, who's the pastor down the road, gets in the car, drives over to Terry's house, pounds on the door. Terry doesn't answer. His best friend pounds on the door. Terry doesn't answer. So his best friend decides, I'm going in anyways. Climbs through a window. Terry yells, get out, get out. And the best friend said, come with me. Come now. I'm not going with you anywhere. Yes, you are. And his best friend just grabbed him and put him in his car, drove him over to the church, brought him into the sanctuary and said, now don't you leave this sanctuary until you and God get this right. And in that sanctuary, 
The pastor locked the door, put signs on, do not bother him, left a few bottles of water. Terry was there 18 hours. He says, the first four hours, I was a sulky little baby Christian. I sat in the front row of the church and I didn't do anything. I just sat there like this. And then all of a sudden, a few hours into it, I started telling God what I thought of him. How dare you take my wife? I have traveled for you. I have served you. I've gone to every country you've wanted me to. I've slept on the streets. I've slept on the... And he started to give all the stuff. And then all of a sudden, he heard in his heart, go to the piano. And he sat down on the piano and just started playing some gospel songs and started to worship God. God wasn't there when he was sitting as a sulky little baby. God was not there when he was yelling. But God showed up when he started to worship. And all of a sudden, after 10 hours of fighting with God and not winning, he started to worship. And for the next eight hours, God started to heal him. Some of the darkest hours I've ever been through, God has used me in the most powerful way. But I've had to keep my eye on Christ, not the darkest hour. I, John, in suffering, I'm your companion in the faith, patience, endurance. I'm on the Isle of Patmos. I'll probably die here, but it's for God and the testimony of Christ. Guess what? In my darkest hour, I get to write the book of Revelation. Absolutely crazy. God, you don't make sense, but I'm going to go with you. I'm going to worship you. All of hell doesn't want you to hear this sermon. All of hell. So there's two questions I give to you. Number one question is, so what should I do with this sermon? What should I do with the worship this morning? Well, number one, you should respond to it as fast as you can because all hell wants you to forget this sermon. The second question is, how will I do it? Well, you need to just write down what you think the Holy Spirit wants you to do. But here's the sermon. In your darkest hour, are you worshiping the Lord more than you've ever worshipped before?